exciting that it's Susan's pup day. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, her actual pup day. Do I, did I turn it on? Hit that screen. Hello? Hello? <laughs> there we are, right? Uh, I'm only speaking right now because I am going to be sort of moderating. Um, I'm so lucky to be here with these incredible novelists, and I actually finished Susan's book this morning and then immediately emailed her to tell her how much I loved it. Um, it is a tour de force. And of course, I'm an old friend of Mary's. We've been friends forever, and um, I loved, of course, Baby to the Moon. So I'm delighted to be here talking about issues that really matter to me. Uh, and as we were beginning to think about this conversation, um, we started to wrestle with the question of <clears throat> why Susan and Mary don't call their work historical fiction, even though it takes place partly in the past. And so let me start with that question, which is, Maybe we could have that public conversation that we've done in private about, about what it is and why you don't exactly consider your work historical fiction. Well, I don't because I feel as though I grew up in a city in which the context is not what I do. The context is politics. And what you do gain from living in Washington or lose, depending on how things are going at the moment. <laughs> but what you gain is a consciousness about what's going on in the country. Not the real country, but the country in which laws are made, decisions are discussed, there are lots of journalists. And so if you're a creative writer, um, you are as incidental as can be. And that's a a wonderful way to be, but I grew up a little girl, very conscious of what was going on, and also without a tremendous amount of interest in it. So in all of my books, I was looking at my work just to be able to say something halfway true. And in all of my works, there is a context of history. I think of people, the characters in my book, as living in a certain time in a certain place, responding in certain ways to the world they live in. And so I don't feel that's historical fiction, but I also instinctively, from so much novelist, I'm afraid I would uh, fail to tell the truth in, in terms of historical truth. I, yeah. I was once in a situation in which a novelist said, to another novelist who was very strong about observing everything correctly, said, uh, you know, you change the road in the end out of Rondacks. It doesn't go that way. <laughs> and I thought that would be <laughs> Right, right, exactly. I did an event uh, with Lily King, who wrote Euphoria. I don't know if you know the writer, Lily King. Um, and it was, we were asked this question, and I, <clears throat> it was when my novel Orphan Training had come out, and I felt this great responsibility to the many people I'd interviewed who'd written up orphan trains and their descendants, four million descendants of these train, quarter of a million train riders, and um, to, to be as accurate as I could, in part because people didn't know that story. But um, Lily, who had written about Margaret Mead, although she changed her name in Euphoria, said, like, I didn't go there. I <laughs> any fact I didn't like I changed. I had no she said it did not bother me at all to be accurate. And if she said, in my view, if anybody wants to read about Margaret Mead and really learn what she did, you can go to uh, you know, many uh, biographies, but I'm not doing that. And don't read me for the facts. I'm not interested in serving that purpose for you. And I thought that was really um, very well said and interesting. And you really had a sense of what it means? Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, the reason I don't want to be thought of as a historical, you know, writer of historical fiction is because I weigh more on the side of story rather than history. So um, there's an anecdote I loved about Russell Banks once told about um, when he published Cloud Splitter. He said he got a call at 11 o'clock at night from his town librarian. And she said, you know that scene where uh, he crossed, they crossed the Hudson and they cross on a bridge 
And she, he goes, yeah, I know that scene. And she goes, well, there's no, there was no bridge. And he said, I needed a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm one of those people, like, if I need a bridge, I need a bridge. Like, whatever I need for the story, I will make that choice without doing something that's completely egregious you know, and ridiculous. But I don't want to be held up to a standard of a historian. I'm not a historian. And one of the things I found when I published Gateway to the Moon, like I recently gave a talk where someone said, well, who was the last person to die at the hands of the Inquisition? And I was like, I didn't want to say this, but like, I don't know. And it's not that I don't know that with, my di with different novels, I, I make different rules. And to me, that's part of the joy of writing novels. Well, this actually is the nature of the character in Morning is Tomorrow, which is that she is a professor of anthropology. Therefore, Lily King's book was very helpful to me in all the ways yeah. it was probably not helpful to the family of Margaret Mead. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she, it, it, she loves the stories as an anthropologist. She is an investigator of the stories, and they matter to her because they are about home. And I think that way I kind of sidestep being a professor of anthropology, which I didn't want to do. But you yeah. did a really good job with it, can I just say that? Mm -hmm. like, I liked your doctoral dissertation. <laughs> I thought that was really good. I mean, that's you have to take the book to find out. So, well, let's <laughs> actually, so let's step back because my next question was exactly this, which is, um, most people haven't read your book because it just came just out today. Came out. So talk about talk about how this book happened and how it began in your mind. What was how did this happen? Well, interestingly, the way it happens bears no relationship to anything except for the Uh My grandfather. Uh, I never I never met my grandparents. This takes place in Wisconsin where I've never been, at a boys' camp, where I was going with my mother because both of her parents died very young. And we were going to do a canoe trip. And she died suddenly, a couple of months later, and we never took the canoe trip. But in that time that she was ill, my grandfather was the son, this particular grandfather, was the son of Danish, he was Danish, of one of the people with his father was on the as, as a boy. Interesting. And so I read it at first for that because I was really interested. I didn't know about it and I preferred to read a novel about it. <laughs> so that, this book started, however, much more strangely and disturbed. Um, I found a picture of my grandparents on a lake in front of the boys' camp. This book takes place on a river because it's more exciting. And, um, <laughs> and I was looking at this picture of the two of them, and they're sitting, it's very bucolic, and they're very sweet looking people. And by the time I got downstairs to make a cup of coffee, he had turned into a man who murdered his wife. <laughs> so I, that's all I had for a very long time. <laughs> but it did come from this picture of my grandfather and the sense of isolation and the sense of their relationship, which I destroyed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the time you were upstairs to the time you went to I just began, tea. I do not know, but by the time I got downstairs, I was thinking, what could have, what if, what what could have happened? Yeah. Which I think is the, what happens with a novelist. Something hits a chord, don't you think? Yeah. And, and some image, some story, some person, some photograph, some sight, um, and something begins to happen. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's sort of a when I'm I, you're open, and, and I'm sure many of you are writers here. Oh, you can Amanda Airborne over there. Um, but I, for me, when I'm open in that way, I'll have a moment like that, and then things just sort of, I feel like a whale with the krill kind of coming through, like, um, that I feel that I'm just sort of absorbing things, and that they're, they're, they're finding their place in my story. For a while, it feels like it builds in that way, that you, that things come to you from all over. Um, there, Virginia Woolf said, arrange whatever pieces come your way. 
and it sort of feels like that to me that you that I that I when I'm open in that way I I take in a lot in ways that I might not even be conscious of. But what about for you? Yeah, no, so I want to throw something because I think it's very germane to what we're talking about. So, um, uh, so Gateway to the Moon, the, the, the origin of Gateway to the Moon actually happened 30 years ago. We were living in New Mexico, and um, for any of you who've read the book, we hired a babysitter. So there's a character, Rachel Rothstein, who hires a babysitter. And once the babysitter, and this is true in my life, once the babysitter realized that we were a Jewish family, he asked me if we ate pork, and I said that I didn't. And he said, mm. he said, well, neither do I or my family, and my whole town doesn't eat pork. And I was like, your town doesn't eat pork. Like, that was strange. You know, they were all Catholic. And that kind of put this sort of germ in my head, and for a long time I put it aside. But then finally it came to a place where I thought, I'm going to write about what, what are now known as the crypto or secret Jews of New Mexico. And every morning my husband and I take a walk because we have a 100-pound coon hound named James Thurber. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say about the dog. And I think that says it all. And uh, one morning we were taking a walk and I said, you know, that idea has come back to me. I had finished The Jazz Palace, which was a historical novel that took me 17 years. And I definitely did not want to do anything historical. I was done with that. And I said to Larry, uh, you know, I'm thinking about writing about the babysitter and the woman who hires him and just doing it, but it's not going to be historical. I'm not going to go into the Inquisition or any of that. He goes, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. He says, I don't think it'll be as good a book if you don't do the history. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it kind of like, I had to like, yeah. So that's what happened. Those sections, the Inquisition and the, those sections said in the past are so rich. They're so rich. And um, I was just, I read it a few, when it came out, and then I was rereading it today, um, and I was struck by how concrete your details are. Uh, what was that process like? That's a long time ago to be writing, to make come alive um, for the reader without it feeling like a costume drama. That's, that's you know, again, I, I, I wrote to the story more than the details. Like the details, you can Google most of that stuff. Like, for example, when I was working on The Jazz Palace, which is a much more specific example for me, I knew Al Capone was going to be in the book, but I didn't know how. And I read a terrific biography of Al Capone, and I got to a place where it said that Al Capone was a great dancer. I think it was on page 382, and there were 600 pages, and I stopped reading there. Because <laughs> once I knew that Capone was a good dancer, he would dance. That's all I needed. So I think you find that detail. You talk about it in your um, thing with Lisa, where you talk about you find a detail that, that opens the story. Yeah. Because you want to open the story. That's right. And then when you find that detail, you just stop doing the research. Was there a detail for you in this, in your novel, that really opened it up for you, or a kind of telling moment? I suppose the telling moment for me um, really was that um, I have this book. There's a 13-year-old boy who's keeping a journal of what he hopes will happen, which is that they go on this long trip to find out whether the protagonist of the novel, who's now 70, but when she was four years old, her father confessed to murdering her mother at a campsite where everybody's sleeping in tents. One of the problems I have with this novel is there's a lot of time on one river and one campsite with not a lot of people. It's hard to write a novel. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, as soon as it was the first thing I wrote, as soon as I got this nerdy 13-year-old boy who's kind of prescient and he speaks without, ever since his father died, he's unable to finish a sentence unless he's with his family. He starts a thought and then he stops. But he wants more than anything for, and this was a detail and it came from a writer named Howard Norman. And Howard Norman said, I used to start that sentence and then I couldn't stop it. And so I would try to do it. He's, he's a very funny and very rich writer. It, I, I would start to stutter as soon as I tried to finish the sentence. And so I stopped talking. Uh, he now talks a lot. <laughs> Not that big. But this kid wants to be able to go back to the Alice Field Junior High School in Washington, D.C. and not be a nerd. 
and not be somebody who's everybody is kind of afraid of because his father died and they might catch it. And he started the novel and, and he, that particular day, the detail about not being able to finish a sentence. In the end, he writes the end of the story. You started with Thomas? I started. Oh, that's so interesting. So Thomas is the boy, mm -hmm. and boy. his sections are threaded throughout. Right. Um, oh gosh. Okay. Now I have some. Uh, now I have some questions about uh, craft. I guess if it's all right with you to indulge <laughs> us, <laughs> to indulge me. Right. Um, so okay. So right. Right. Say, right? Yeah. No, we can't talk about craft. Um, <laughs> so okay. So you have the all this research that you are doing or have done. Last night I was in an event with uh, Rebecca Mackay, and she was talking about The Great Believers, her new novel, which actually involved a lot of research. Um, I mean, it was written before she was aware of the world, right. and um, she the research she did is quite intense. And she said, I did four years of research and four years of writing concurrently meaning it was all overlapping. Some people talk about doing the research first. So how did you tackle that or approach that? And did you end up putting things, as some authors say, they put the research aside and just write after a while? I, I tend, I find that I, there are always, I feel like Harold on the Purple Crayon, where I have to draw a door and then the doorknob and then open the door and get in the <laughs> robo and I don't know what the robot is made of so I have to look it up. I always find that there are details that I haven't thought through so I'm always researching but I wonder about you. Me? Yes. yes. Well, yes. you know, it's really interesting because Google has been so helpful. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's, it's yeah, how do you research? Them? Do you go to libraries? I mean, do you go to no, libraries? I, in the beginning, I did. When I first started writing in this particular book, um, I imagined a story and then there were things I needed to know and I went after them, however you go after them. But I did write a book called Daughters of the New World, um, which covers 100 years in one family of women. And I started that by meeting a researcher who would look into the First World War and women in the First World War. In the first set of information that he took me, took, that he sent to me, I had already spent more money than my opinion. <laughs> and so I decided that the research that I did, I would have to do on my own, and I would have to do it very specifically. I would have to know what I needed to know in order to move on. Just to respond to that, I hired a researcher once, and I I felt so removed from the material. Yeah. I, for me, the research is part of the process. I it is. I don't want to delegate that to anyone. I can't. I can't. Never done it again. Yeah, and it didn't feel. I didn't have the closest to it. And also, I know this happens to all of us who do research. You start on one thread, and then suddenly it takes you in a different direction. And actually, that direction can be very fruitful. Okay. Um, I have a hole in the novel I'm working on now, I have a whole um, section that opened up to me because of a line in one other rabbit hole I've gone down. So I, I find that that's sort of how the books happen. And, be, and having that strange tension and combination of um, fi figuring out a direction for your book but being open enough to to change that you yeah. can incorporate other things. And if you don't find it yourself, somehow it's not, it's it's like getting lost in a city or something. Like you want to get lost in the city. You don't want someone else to get lost for you. You know what I mean? Or like sense. when my husband's driving and I don't know, pay any attention to where we're going, mm -hmm. and then I try it myself and can't get there. It's right. like you want to be the one driving. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, um, f for my sins, I'm working on the sequel to Gateway to the Moon. Um, that, um, anyway, that's all of it. I'm working on the sequel and it's all set in Jamaica. And um, so I've been making several trips down to Jamaica and I have become friends with a woman who is a historian of 
cemeteries, which is very germane to my work, believe it or not. But whenever I arrive in Jamaica, she leaves a giant box of books at my hotel. She just drops them off. Whether I'm going to see her or not, she just leaves them. And my bed looks like a crazy graduate student's room, <laughs> you know, so when I'm not out doing research, I'm, you know. And she dropped off this one book that was this self-published history of a very prominent um, Jewish Jamaican family, which is the, you probably uh, would know who Chris Blackwell is. He's the founder of Island Records, which was the founder of Bob Marley. So it's the Blackwell family. Anyway, I was reading this, and there was this small arcane detail about, and this is a little depressing, but it just resonated deeply for me about a, a Jewish slaver, because there were Jews who were involved in the slave trade, who sold 12 slaves to a man, and these 12 slaves thought they were going to go to a sugarcane plantation, which is what happened, and instead this man wanted them to um, plant a garden. And they spent the rest of their lives planting oleander and hibiscus. And that detail just grabbed me. And so this book that I thought was going to be about like all other kinds of things, including the search for Columbus's last lost gold, is now a book about plants. <laughs> but I'm loving it, you know. And it was just if I hadn't read that little sentence about these plants and what happened to these twelve enslaved people, I wouldn't have gone in that direction. And I don't think anybody could have found that detail. So it maybe it maybe the whole thing may be a giant mistake. And it would, a rabbit hole, but it wouldn't have resonated for you yeah. because you're you're reading some report about right. what someone else has found for you, and, right. and then when somebody else they wouldn't have found, found it anyway know. because you weren't looking at plants. Sure. You know, so sure. no, that's the point. Yeah, it just sort of seeps in and then becomes something else. And you have these small details that go through. Well, can I just throw one other thing yeah. out, which is. Um, uh, there's, I have a friend, a Jamaican friend who I, I thought would be here, but she could, probably couldn't make it. But she, when she read Gateway, she called me and she said, uh, there were no mangoes in um, Jamaica during the time of Columbus. There were pineapples. And I was like, great. <laughs> so, um, so I have to change, you know, I called my publisher. I said, change it in the paperback. But she also said, you know, they came about the same time as breadfruit. And I'm like, what's breadfruit? And she said, oh, breadfruit, that came with Captain Bly, Mutiny on the Bounty. And like, the minute you know that, and you start to, then I know, if you want to know anything about breadfruit now, I can tell you. <laughs> but also, it's just a direction you go in that you never thought. You just go in. That's right. right. Like, how did you come up with the Lithuanian Jew? Um, I the always, father. No. Lithuania was so destroyed. And, and so I'm always in the back of my mind. I like word. I and um, I've, I've always thought that if I wrote about a Jew who emigrated to this country in the 30s, that I'd be the Yeah. Well, so this whole conversation about uh, other cultures brings up um, a question I have about appropriation uh -huh. and about of the conversation that's ongoing. Oh, Rebecca McKay was talking about this a lot last night, actually, about her terror writing about um, gay men in the 80s and the AIDS crisis, but also people of color, um, men of color. Who, uh, she has one central figure who's quite big. And, that, um, and someone was challenging, was saying to her, um, oh, it's ridiculous. You know, it's ridiculous. You should be able to write about what you want to write about. And she said, and I tend to agree with this, I actually think these questions are really important. And I think that I should be challenged. And I think it is complicated to write about people from other cultures. And um, she said, I had terror that I think was healthy. I think my terror was healthy. And I, I had a lot of people read it, and I did a lot of checking. Um, and so I just wonder, because both of you have written about other cultures and other races in these books, how, do you, how did you approach it, or how do you feel about I am, it? I, am a bit, I, I do have a point of view that I take, and there, is black there are two black characters in this book. And um, they are significant. And I should also say, say I wrote this book under the presidency of Obama. Um, we are such a fractured country right now. I wouldn't have, it's not that I feel any differently. I grew up in a black city. I'm, I lived in 
interesting life in terms of race. But um, I, I just wouldn't put myself out there in that particular way for that particular argument. I teach in a university. That argument is rich in the university. But I did feel that as long as I didn't take on the interior point of view of another culture, that, um, and I don't. But I also remember that Gloria Naylor once said to me, and she did not suffer fools lightly when I had a book of blacks and whites coming out. And I said, I'm worried about this. And this was years ago uh, when people didn't worry about appropriation in the same way. She said, we all got hearts and souls, don't we? And, um, and I do believe that, too. I mean, I think that the question of getting across the street is, is a hard question. And I think, I think language is truly important. I think the fact that um, I, I know it, I'm much more comfortable about it with, about it with African Americans, but with an African American who's 10 years younger than me, whose father was a cab driver, whose mother was a domestic, who was a novelist named Marita Goldman. We did a book um, about black and white women writing about race. And the white women learned a lot. We learned publicly and on the radio and in book readings. And I became so much more conscious of the language, not even talking about appropriation, but how we use language. And I think I am certainly not great at it, but I'm conscious. Mary? Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Um, no, it's really tough. And, you know, in the, in the Jamaica book, um, you know, it's a, it's a narrative between, um, well, I seem to do Jews and Blacks quite a bit. So uh, let, me, let me talk about the Jazz Pals, because I think that's a little more, I'm farther, it's, written, it's published, so obviously I'm farther along with that. Um, <laughs> but when I was, so I, I really wanted to sort of tell, the story of a, uh, a musician kind of based on my father. So it was sort of an amateur, not amateur, but in the novel he's not an amateur at all, but a jazz musician, a Jewish jazz musician in Chicago in the 1920s. And the more I read and the more research I did, and we were talking about the, the detail, and the detail that really grabbed me was when I learned that blacks and whites could not play together um, in bands because of, they had separate unions, they just couldn't play together. They had separate unions that wouldn't be paid. Um, there's a famous scene in, um, oh God, what was that? Uh, Fountain Abbey, where the, the jazz musician goes to England and he, 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 the black jazz musician is directing the, the white band from Chicago. No, it's just so historically impossible. It was insane. So I, but I realized that I couldn't, how could I really write about the period that I wanted to write in if I didn't bring a person of color into the story? And once I started looking at Jewish immigration and black migration and how it actually came together in the south side of Chicago and how it played out both musically and culturally, you know, I, I, I had to own it, basically. But also, it's, um, you know, the feeling that we're all people. Yeah. You just have to be sensitive to what, you know, you have to be sensitive. So I'm going to ask easy. one last question. Yeah. Do you have one? Did you want to add something? No. Oh, I'm going to ask one last question, and then we'll open it up. Two questions. Uh, my, my question is, speaking about myself, yes. um, I, every, I was saying this to Mary earlier, or maybe it was to Amanda, that uh, I, I, I get very embroiled in a novel, and then I say, I'm never doing that again. And then I do something that feels even harder, which is, I don't know what mistake I'm making. Right. But do you feel that you will, does part of you want to just knock off doing the historical stuff and do a contemporary novel? Where, how do you feel now? Do you just love doing this historical research? Do you think you'll <laughs> always have a component <laughs> of it? I, I feel I'm a novel. Yeah. And uh, I don't write short stories, but I really feel comfortable with the novel. So um, I hope another one comes. The research actually is a relief. There's something that is relieving about it. But I think we're all novelists here, and we're all storytellers. Not every novelist is a storyteller. 
but um, and, and that's just what brings you to the novel, and the story brings me to the novel. Uh, but there was something that really named this evening, which was that I was at an event um, in Washington that Richard Howard was at. He was entirely different than I thought he would be. I'd never met him before. Um, and he was, he was lovely and easy. And a lot of environmentalists, because his new book, The Overstory, is about trees. A lot of environmentalists were saying, you know, why, um, why is the environment not a sexy subject? Why have we had so much trouble with things like the EPA? And how is it that you're doing so well with this book about trees? Mm -hmm. And he said, it takes a novel to tell that story. Mm -hmm. And when you read this novel, <clears throat> you fall in love with trees. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what brings me to the novel. Yes. Before the argument. Yes, lovely. I mean, the short answer is, yeah, I'd love to just sit down and write a thriller or something. <laughs> just not have to think about anything. And um, I do, um, I actually have a travel book coming out next year. I sort of snuck a book in there, so I don't have to pay attention to the Jamaica book right now. And it's all about tigers, and I love being about the tigers in, in a theoretical way. Um, <laughs> but, um, the thing about the Jamaica book that's really been interesting for me is, I mean, there's a lot that's been written about, I mean, there's a wonderful book called Jewish Pirates of the Caribbean, which is kind of my Bible, and it's just a great book to read anyway, um, about why Jamaica has the culture, the complex culture it does. But all my friends in Jamaica, and everyone says, I, they, they want me to tell the story. Like, they want a novelist, to, they're not a historian, they, they want there to be a novel about their story, and I feel an obligation to do that. And then after that, I think I'm going to write literary romance. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just, just have fun. We'll, we'll be open up for literary That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so let's open it up and see if people have questions. Does anybody? Yes. Um, Susan, I'm curious. Uh, I work as a designer and a photographer. So I know where my inspiration comes from, but as a writer, how do you feel inspiration comes? Like, is it, do you feel like it comes from a higher source, or do you feel like it springs from your imagination, or under what circumstances do ideas flow through you easiest? I, I, I really, um, I really love to listen, and, and you can hear a lot when you listen. And I think I've lived my life by the imagination, which really has a lot of down. But that is much more my inspiration than um, it's listening. And I hope not stealing, but it's listening and, and uh, it's stories. There's something wonderful about stories. When Toni Morrison uh, accepted her Nobel Prize, it was essentially with the, the fact that stories are the beginning and the end. And, um, and I think that's where my inspiration comes. They're not always there, but it's always what I'm listening to. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Great. Great question. Another question? Mary, you made a comment earlier about changing mango to pineapple. Yes. Mm -hmm. Made me think about the editorial process. Yeah. And has that changed for any of you over the time you've been writing novels? She's asking about the editorial process and said Mary's comment about mangoes to pineapples made her wonder about maybe how involved the editor is and whether that's changed. And, al and also, can you now anticipate what your editor is going to revise before you send it? Has that changed over the course of several months? I mean, one thing that I have found over the years is that it's almost the opposite of too many cooks spoiling the soup or whatever they spoil. Um, I find that having a lot of, of readers and a lot of eyes on the page is very helpful, especially when there's historical. Like, I didn't, wouldn't have gotten the mangoes and the pineapples ever if this person hadn't pointed it out to me. Um, by the same token, you have to own your own work, and it's got to be yours, and, you know, uh, if I needed to be mangoes, I would have kept the mangoes, you know, but I think it's, it's a balancing act, and um, you know, I had a three-hour meeting with my editor, who used to be Susan's editor, this week, who told
told me over the phone how much she loved the book, and then I got there and she said, but you have to change the whole ending. And I'm like, wait a minute, like, I love it, but it's not the right ending. And she said, well, this has to end like 30 pages sooner. I'm like, what? You know, so, I mean, it's a process, um, and often a painful one, I find. Yeah. And you can't always anticipate what your editor, in that, I have like, no idea. In that case, for example. No, it's the equivalent of an ambush. A literary ambush. <laughs> <laughs> and I love ambush. <laughs> yes. Um, so today, everything is annotated, right? Everything is hyperlinked. You know, you, you send out a Kindle and you see how many people have liked it, and, and even like you look up a song and find every beat with comments on every beat. If you're writing about the past, you write about the present, but if you write about the past, today are you writing with an expectation or a knowledge that your work will be annotated, maybe annotated to, to an explosive degree by others? That's a really interesting question, James. <laughs> um, I, I barely can go through. My brain doesn't go there. <laughs> do, you, do you have footnotes in your books? What? Do you have footnotes? Do I have footnotes? You, so if you're writing, I guess the other question. Right. Where this no, question I came mean, from was wondering I, whether you are, are already footnoting your books. I, that's right. And I think that it would, I, I don't see them foot, footnoting my books. And that's a blessing. <laughs> I mean, it kind of goes with where we are now and the question that you asked. And just to sort of say very quickly, I started where your editor came to your house from New York, wherever you live, and sat next to you and edited. Mm -hmm. And the copy editor did much the same thing. There were many, too many books. My editor is here. She's a wonderful editor. Um, and she is tough. <laughs> and that is valuable. But uh, I, I think editors don't have time. And then when you come to that, it's really going to be interesting. I guess I should say, I hope I'm at run. You have to be That's ready engagement, to the <laughs> but, but By the same token, I, I began reading a novel by a very distinguished writer. And the novel opened with an explanation of the historical context for the book and why the book was written. And I, it was a galley, so I tore it out because I didn't want to know that. I wanted to read the story. I didn't want it explained to me before. If you want to put that at the end, cool. That's fine. But I don't want to start with yeah. it because I want to enter the story and not the explanation of the story. And I think there is so much of that that, that goes on now. I felt really sorry for this, this friend of mine on Facebook, um, Caroline Levitt's husband, Jeff Tumlin. He's a wonderful, he's a music historian, and he, poor guy, put a post up about all the inaccuracies in the Elton John movie. And I've never seen such a long thread of people <laughs> objecting to all of his, you know, just an argument about, you know, do we want to be entertained? Is it something, do we want his accuracy? And it just went on and on. But, but the answer is yes, we're very heavily annotated. This question. I, I think it's really interesting, and I appreciate the engagement, uh, I, I actually. I like the fact that there are lots of people paying attention to the details. I mean, it can get ridiculous. It, um, on Goodreads, which I don't even look at normally, but I went to your guys' today just as I was thinking about questions. And I, like, one of them was some stupid thing about some about place, I think, but it felt so minor, but it, obviously it's someone who lives near there, grew up near there. But, um, but you know, I think that there is that. You can get in the weeds. People get very much in the weeds with the details. Yeah. Can I, may I share an anecdote? Not about me, it's not about me, but I once heard Barry Unsworth tell this story at a conference on historical fiction, and he had written the BBC screenplay to the Count of Monte Cristo. And it opened with the person who becomes a Count of Monte Cristo being essentially thrown off a cliff, he's wrapped in linen, or he's supposed to be a dead body, and somehow he gets out of the, the linen he's wrapped in and he swims to shore. It was a completely preposterous scene. So it, it, the next morning, there were, he said there were 100 emails. And he opened them up and he just assumed everyone was going to say he never could have gotten out of the shroud. It never would have happened. But that's not what they said. They said that at the time when the planet Monte Cristo would have swam to shore, he would not have done the Australian crawl because it wasn't invented and they were all swimming stories. <laughs> so he, he said to the, every single one was saying he would have swam, he would have been the swim, swam, whatever, the restaurant. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> anyway, you can't get it all right. You can't get it all right. Yeah, sometimes it's 
fun to hear it though. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? We can change it here next week. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, let me ask one more then. Um, what are you working on now? You said that your most, the next book will be a tiger. It's going to be a tiger book. Yes. Tell, explain. That's a, okay, so I've, oh so I've done um, four, and this will be my fifth. I have a sort of sideline of, uh, I've written books about being a solo traveler, a woman traveling alone. And this one called All the Way to the Tigers, um, there are various reasons why I made this decision, but I began searching and researching tigers about 12 years ago. And I wrote this book, and I put it away for two years. And when I realized that I wasn't going to get to, the, I wasn't going to meet the deadline on the Jamaica book, I thought, well, I'll just call my editor and just say, hey, how about, how about you look at this? You know, this, <laughs> this, this. <laughs> um, and she loved it. Yeah. And it had just been sitting in a drawer. So I was like, you're kidding. So, um, so it's, about, it's about searching <laughs> tigers. It's about. Well, I, I'll just share this one thing that's like I love about tigers is that um, so all unseen tigers in the jungle, if you can't see a tiger, you always call it she. So she's out there. And they are solitary apex predators. And as a women writers, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> what does apex mean? Top of the top of the food chain. Yeah. They will eat you. Yeah. Your family. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Okay. What about you, Susie? <laughs> I am, I, and this book was briefly called The Home for the Incurables. The Home for the Incurables is a, is a um, it, it, it was a building on the way to school when I was a little girl, and The Home for the Incurables was the most terrifying name. And you could see the incurables upstairs, and I would stand behind the tree and look at them. In my novel, this new novel, um, the protagonist buys the home for the incurable. So she feels, fills it with strangers. And I lived like that for a little while. Both my husband and I, with four young children, lost our jobs one day apart. Um, my job, just to say where I fall in the life chain of women, uh, my job was one when I had a contract, but they decided they would prefer to have a man. Mm -hmm. I was a woman teaching at the National Cathedral mm -hmm. School for Girls. And so they fired me and hired the man. I mean, he was, it, I already had a contract for the next year. But in any case, that sent me out of high school teaching into college teaching. And in terms of the home for the incurables, we created this life, my husband and I, with these children. Okay, we live in this big house that belongs to the Washington Cathedral. We pay very little rent, and we will um, rent out rooms, and we will survive that way. We will pay no rent to the cathedral. They will pay the rent. They will pay for our food and the pediatrician and so forth until we both get jobs again. And it was a crazy four or five years. We got jobs, but we continued <laughs> to in the house with strangers. And it, it's, I'm, it's kind of a memoir. Oh, yeah. Interesting. That's this book, this new book, is kind of a memoir. Yeah. But would you ever use the title Hope for the Incurables? That's what I'm using. Again. <laughs> That's what I'm using. Oh, this book you're working on now. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah. because she has that same situation in the novel that's actually out. Yeah. So it is out today. So that's really so I'm fantastic. I love it. I love it. How <laughs> oh, wonderful. Can I just say that I was actually one of the people that Susan took yeah, at one point, and that's how we became out of the novel. Not that I was incurable. Australia. It's called the Tin Ticket because these women wore tin tickets stamped with a number around their necks that identified them. And uh, 
It's coming out next year. Oh, I have a public question I could ask the whole group, actually. <laughs> so in, actually, Jill, I would be able to weigh in on this. In publishing, there's, you know, we have this president, Donald Trump, who's running for re-election, and he's doing so in the fall of 2020. So much of publishing is avoiding fall, um, especially for novels, because it feels that there's a great steamroller of nonfiction television basically rolling over anyone's interest to do anything else. And um, so my book is scheduled for May, but I wonder if counterintuitively, because no one's publishing in the fall, <laughs> if, um, and everyone's publishing in May, you're like, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. 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 Can we agree? No. 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 A terrible time, right? Jill, which one? The books that came out in when Trump yeah. was elected. It was yeah. inexpensive. That's why it was yeah. really terrible. It was yeah. You just didn't expect the whole it. So no I mean, it's a chance. Yeah. I feel that we have consensus. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.